uh, level, the fifth generation fixed network that enables new use cases to maximize the benefit of our optical fiber networks. Then we'll also continue to talk about the new applications happening in the optical and the photonic domain to expand the impact of what we're doing here. Then we'll be uh, talking about some future perspectives uh, followed by some concluding remarks. So uh, as an overview of optical networks in the 5G era, as many of you, many of you know now, we are uh, studying the 5G um, in year two, uh, you know, uh, 2019, 2020, and the 60 will come in 2030. So the coming years will be focusing on 5G and enhance 5G. And in our optical network, we are not only going to support 5G, but also we are going to uh, complement the 5G by delivering services to home enterprises, in the, uh, you know, factories, farms, uh, mining sites, ports, and many places. Yeah, just uh, using 5G application as an example. 5G, you always see the you know, cell towers. Uh, and uh, you, you know, in our optic communication domain, we know there are underlying optical networks to support the communication for optical access, for metro aggregation, core network, and also data center interconnections. Uh, using 5G application as an example, for a typical large city in China, the front row segment will re require over 600 terabits per second of capacity. Those will be primarily supported by fiber networks. Then we have a middle hole, back hole, and data center connections, and long hole. Um, so uh, you can find more uh, you know, references uh, in the literature and I list some of uh, our own publications. So basically, to address the demands of 5G, we need to support high bandwidth communication low latency, accurate synchronization with a very limited timing jitter, and also the ability to network slicing to address each end user, each end use case or service with a guaranteed quality of service. And we can all do that with advanced optical networks. Uh, then now we can go step by step. From the tower, we have the front hall, Middle hole, back hole. Um, front hole can be supported by CPRI, Common Public Radio Interface, which dramatically simplifies the remote uh, unit. On the other hand, it is require more interface bandwidth. So for a typical 5G use case with 64 by 64 MIMO and 100 megahertz RF uh, bandwidth, we need over 300 gigabit per second of signal. With the uh, evolved CPRI, this bandwidth requirement can be reduced to 25G. That's why 25G optics is very important for front hole links nowadays. And uh, here are uh, uh, just some um, uh, curves to show the required uh, NAND bit rates for different uh, configurations of the 5G antennas. So for the front hole segment based on ECPRI, uh, 12 by 25G channels would be a good use case to address a lot of uh, uh, deployment uh, scenarios. And this can be based on NAN WDM called LWDM using 12 channels uh, uh, with uh, NAN WDM channel spacing of 800 gigahertz. And Dr. Junjie Li of the China Telecom gave a very nice invite talk at the ECOC last year uh, to talk about uh, how uh, NAN WDM can be used. In ACP conference last year, as a plenary speech, uh, Dr. Hani of China Mobile gave another uh, exciting talk about uh, you know, the 5G deployment and uh, technologies. Their uh, CWDM-based MWDM was mentioned. Yeah, as you can see, a lot of uh, uh, optical technologies are being utilized to support uh, the 5G deployment. So as you know, for optical access, we're not only just to support antenna size, we're also supporting fiber to the home, fiber to the business, fiber to the building, to the enterprise by 
passive optical network. Uh, in the world, a uh, G-Pong has been very successful. And in China, 10 g pump was, uh, and 10 g symmetric pump um, is being actively deployed uh, to support the fiber to the home, especially during pandemic. Many people are working and studying in home and uh, uh, very good uh, connectivity at home is important. And going forward, uh, ITU is standardizing the 50 g pump. Uh, the good news is that it has been approved for uh, publication by the end of this year. Yeah. So we will have the next generation passive option network based on 50 GB per second downstream. And upstream can be 25 GB per second or 50 GB per second in the future. So the wavelength plan has been decided uh, in the O band for downstream and the upstream, either uh, 1270 nanometers or 1300 nanometers to have a coexistence with uh, uh, G pound or uh, 10 G pound. Then with this uh, 50 G uh, capacity in passive optical network, we could even support some of the 5G antennas in the densitification scenario. There we need to care about the latency. So uh, the ITU group uh, is uh, uh, studying and advancing this idea of a cooperative dynamic bandwidth location to coordinate the uh, wireless equipment and the optical equipment so that we can have a, a low latency, even if we are using TDMA. Yeah. And, and the basic idea is to have the communication between wireless uh, distributed unit and the optical line terminal so we can anticipate the traffic pattern so we can prepare the network in advance, such as the latency for negotiation will be removed. Then the uh, ORAN uh, is, uh, Alliance is also working on the specification of a cooperative transport interface to support this kind of use cases. And you can find more from the references here. So for Pong, as you know, we sometimes have a new user adding to the network. We had to perform ranging and that will interrupt the service. But for high quality services, such as the 5G services, we want to have a uninterrupted uh, operation. For that, we can have a dedicated active activation wavelengths, for example, using the very low cost GPON wavelengths to uh, assist the high speed 50 GPON to realize uninterrupted low latency operation. And this is being standardized by ITU and also you can find more in some of the publications. So then now we move on to data centers. As you know, data centers are so important uh, to enable cloud computing, storage, uh, content uh, generation, and then many more things. And the, the capacity increase in data center connections, both internal and the intra, uh, uh, inter and the intra uh, connections are increasing at a pace of over 27% per year. Uh, per year. Uh, here I show just an example of globally de deployed hyperscale data centers. In one of the hyperscale data centers, you can see there are so many uh, racks uh, uh, of uh, servers, uh, sometimes over one million servers uh, to provide the needed computation. And there are a lot of uh, very good publicly available um, information from Google side and other sites. So inside the data center, we have uh, servers um, arranged in a uh, rack after rack. Uh, then on the top of the rack, you have the top of rack switch uh, connecting to tier one switch, then tier two switch, or even more uh, tiers of switches. And there are different transmission distance requirements. Uh, inside the rack uh, would be less than three meters, uh, typically with uh, copper connections. Then the first tier switch will be connected with the uh, Top of racks, which is with short reach optics with a typical transmission distance of a less than 100 meters. Then we have a data center reach of 500 meters, far reach of two kilometers, depending on the data center size. Then, when uh, in a large data center campus, uh, we need to have a connections between the data center and the regional network gateway to go to the metro network and then 
uh, non core and uh, core networks. Uh, there, um, you know, Microsoft and other companies in the US identified the need to specify this ZR reach uh, of something between 80 and 120 kilometers uh, to have a very high capacity WDM links. And this is a, a very well-defined use case. And for that, in the, the industry uh, had worked uh, uh, very effectively uh, to come up with a solution uh, very quickly. Uh, so this is called a 400 ZR. Uh, here specified, specified by OIF, the Optical Inter-Networking Forum. There, uh, with the extended C-band of 4.8 terahertz, uh, with a channel spacing of uh, 75 gigahertz, 64 DWDM channels, each running at 400 gigabit per second can be supported, giving you a total capacity of 25.6 terahertz per second. So this is quite uh, uh, useful for data center interconnections. Uh, there initially uh, for data, intra data center connections, the coding is also important and we're doing this capacity, channel capacity approaching uh, or air correction coding. Uh, for hard decision coding, uh, where you want to have a, a low latency and a low power consumption, the staircase FEC was introduced. Uh, and this uh, is only 0.6 dB away from channel hard decision uh, limit, quite remarkable. Then for soft decision decoding, um, CFAC, uh, is uh, utilized by OIF for 400 ZR here, which is only uh, about 2 dB away from channel. Uh, advanced FECs such as CFAC plus OFAC and LDPC uh, with even higher overheads, um, you can see from the references, um, we can approach the channel limit uh, to be within uh, 1.4 dB. And those kind of a powerful FECs could be useful for long haul submarine and metro applications. Yeah. Uh, okay.